Let's get started. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, welcome, everyone. We know some of you will continue joining as this goes. And this, as Lindsay just said, it will be recorded. I'm Jerry Levine, Chief Evangelist and General Counsel at ContractPod AI. Uh, with me is uh, James Gatto. James, do you want to introduce yourself? You're muted, James. Uh, hi there, everybody. Uh, I am a partner at uh, Shepherd Mullen. I head up our AI team and look forward to presenting to you today. Great. Uh, so what we're going to do, thanks, Jim. Uh, what we're going to do is we are going to go through a few of the prior notes from the prior session for those of you who were not here or could have missed it. And then we're going to get a bit in more into policy. Uh, I, I hope you all enjoy this friendly little robot that PowerPoint made for me. So uh, there is some there is some benefit to generative AI and AI art. It can make uh, very cute little robots. But so getting started, what is generative AI? I know we've talked about this quite a bit in the past. It's all over the news. It's one of those things everybody is talking about. It is a new type of a newer type of artificial intelligence function using machine learning to gen that can generate novel content uh, and new content, whether that's audio, whether that's code, images, text, or or otherwise, it can generate, it can create something that's new looking. And the reason I say new looking is because as we've all heard, there is a lot of information that goes into training it. Jim, I think we'll talk about this a little later in the session when we talk about more about copyright and other IP related issues. So going on, uh, these generative AI platforms, whether they're contract pod as my company, we have our LIA, which is a generative AI tool for lawyers and legal, legal teams. They're all based on large language models, which is a type of neural network. These are designed to work kind of the way your brain does. And you probably already played with them, whether you've seen them already in your browser through ChatGPT or Google's Bard, you've clicked like I did in PowerPoint or apparently now in Microsoft Paint has a co-pilot now to generate starter images. And for those of, we're talking about Microsoft Paint, the basic painting program that comes in Windows actually just built in an image generator tools like Midjourney, even uh, even conversational AI chat apps like Replica, which is a app that lets you date an AI on your phone. But for, day, for today, all you really need to know is that a large language model is an AI system that's made up of billions of parameters, words, images, ideas that can put it together to make content. Now, whether that content's correct or not, that's a whole different story. Uh, and we talked a little bit about that in our prior panel on ethics and AI. So we moving forward, why would we use these, these kind of tools? There's a ton of benefits, and we'll talk a little bit about the negatives as well, but there's a ton of benefits to using these tools for routine workplace tasks. Again, this is on the slide. I'll talk a little bit about it for those of you who may be calling in or may have trouble viewing this, but there are you are starting to see, we are starting to see that there's time and cost savings, that they're able to analyze data in large amounts far better than humans can do. They can work all the time. And, you know, one of the goals that we all have, I think, especially from my purview and the industries I've worked in, is that we want to get people away from doing mundane tasks that they don't want to do in order to do things that they actually want to do. Personally, I, I think that's the that's the biggest driver for most people. Uh, you know, at least that's what I hope we are moving towards and that we can keep going. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about why we wouldn't want to use them. There are a number of issues that have already arisen that we're finding out about, whether it's bias and employment decisions and other HR issues, whether it's violations of IP or where you have comedians like Sarah Silverman suing OpenAI for using her work to teach the AI. Uh, you could in, get involved in a breach of contract. You could have fraud and misinformation. In fact, just a moment ago, I uh, 
read about another attorney uh, who's a big name, represents a lot of uh, celebrities, especially in hip hop and rap, who is now being accused of ha not understanding how the tools worked and filing poor, uh, filing poorly drafted documents with mistaken citations. Again, I just read that. I still have to catch up on the news, but that headline just came across my desk. And there is the the fear of skill decline, especially due to reliance on these tools and lack of training for junior employees. So there is a lot that still has to be ha still has to happen here, and that's something we'll talk a little bit about as we go through the policy policy discussion. Finally, you know, let's talk a little bit about legal implications, and then I'm going to turn it over to to, to Jim to talk to go through some of these items. There's a ton of implication of legal issues. As I mentioned a moment ago, there's already lawsuits, lawsuits have already started and more will come. There are issues with copyright protection. There are issues with privacy and other liabilities. And the FTC is increasing enforcement as are EU, Australian, governments all over the world are starting to start starting to look at this and go, you know, how do we handle this? Uh, so, you know, we have to talk about how you as a lawyer, as a practitioner, as someone working who may need policies or maybe drafting these policies or trying to figure them out, what you can do. So not just employee use, but training, general analysis policies and all of this. And uh, one thing I think Jim will talk about a little later is this concept of algorithmic disgorgement, which I think is fascinating. And I think, Jim, you've got a little bit more knowledge on that than I do. So I do want to leave that with you. Jim. Great. Thank you. Um, so just to pick up where, where Jerry left off, I mean, <clears throat> with with the variety of legal issues, every, everyone hears about the concerns, the problems, the legal risks of using generative AI. <clears throat> Some companies, in light of that, have taken the position they don't want their employees using generative AI. That That's certainly a safe uh, way to go from a legal perspective, but you you don't get the benefits of generative AI if you if you do that. So the question is, what, mo what most companies are doing is developing guidelines for using AI tools. Um, and as Jerry mentioned in, in, in the last slide there, uh, really kind of the, the main way to do this is for companies to get educated on what the actual facts are about how these tools work. And, and each of the tools work differently. Um, each of the tools have different terms of service. Um, and depending on how you're using them, there's different risk profiles. And so when you kind of become aware of all those issues and kind of get your arms around it, um, you can develop a rational policy that enables employees to use AI, for, certain AI tools for certain purposes. And you can do it in a way that you're not necessarily undertaking significant legal risk. There's various other, you know, aspects to the policy. As Jerry mentioned, there's, you know, ethical issues. Uh, you need to think about the bias and discrimination is, is out there. You need to test for those things if you're creating models. Um, if you're using a third-party tool, you want to make sure that they've been tested for that those purposes um, and, and various other things. But you know, this slide kind of goes through some of the, the high level. But what we're going to cover most of the rest of the webinar is we're going to go through kind of the, what are some of the specific legal issues you need to be aware of? And then how can you, uh, in light of that, develop policies that mitigate uh, those against those those legal issues, um, and and what we're going to see is that there's kind of different buckets of of issues depending on kind of how you're using AI or or what your role is. So, for example, if you're building AI tools, if you're building your own tools, training your own models, developing your own algorithms, uh, there there's kind of a set of issues that you're exposed to. If you're just using a third party tool the issues may be different. So as we'll see, there's different policies companies are developing with respect to building and developing AI versus just using it. But a, a lot of these legal issues we're going to go through and some of the, the lawsuits kind of, uh, some of them bear on, on both uh, of those scenarios. So the first lawsuit, and I'm just going to cover these at a high level. These are all, these have all been relatively recently filed. There's no um, in, in these district court cases we're going to go through, none of them have any dispositive decisions yet. There's been some motions to dismiss, some procedural motions that have been addressed, uh, but nothing really kind of earth shattering yet. So this is really just to give you an idea of 
what are the issues that people are getting sued on currently? We'll see how they they actually turn out as these cases move forward. So the first one is is a, a lawsuit against Google. And the, the gist of it is it alleges that they basically take everything they can get from the internet. They they scrape every site. They use your Gmails. They use your, your calendars. They use all kinds of information they can get and they train their models on it and they don't have a right to do it. That's the gist of that lawsuit. That's, that's kind of a big suit that will cover a wide swatch of um, different types of issues with training data and what's permissible or not permissible. Um, the, this next trio of suits are really kind of all based on authors or other content owners suing OpenAI or Meta, alleging that their work specifically was used to train AI models without permission, and it constitutes copyright infringement. Um, the, the first two cases on this slide against Stability AI, uh, Stability AI has an image generator. So these both relate to using images to train AI models. The first one, the Getty case, alleges that Stability AI uh, improperly used over 12 million Getty photos to train their, their AI image generation system. Um, interestingly, you know, the way these tools are supposed to work is that the, the whole part of generative AI is that it's supposed to create new works or generate new works. Um, and the way the training of the models works is that it ingests, in this case, images. And instead of storing the images, it's supposed to basically learn information about, about the images. So just like we learn when you see a lot of photos of monkeys or dogs or cats, you learn how to distinguish one from another because of the features that you see. You don't typically memorize an image, but if you want to later go and draw a cat versus a dog, you recall the information you learned about what you saw in the images and you use that to create your own image. That's how these are supposed to work. In the Getty case, there's actually uh, images, you may, some of you may have seen them on the internet, where Getty watermarks their images, and the, there's actually some of the output of the uh, Stability AI system includes the Getty watermark. And the argument is if you were creating images from scratch, you wouldn't be putting Getty's watermark on it. Um, so, so that's kind of an interesting case there uh, with respect to that set of facts. And in the other Stability AI case, similar things, it's, it's individual uh, photographers, artists that are claiming their works were used to train the models uh, without permission. And an additional argument in that case is that some of the artists have alleged that the tool can be used to say, give me an image of, you know, a monkey holding a banana uh, in the style of uh, a particular artist. And because they've trained on, on that artist's work, they can create uh, not just you know elements of an image, but they can do it in the style that the artist has adopted. Um, we'll see whether that actually upholds. Generally, style is not protectable because it's more of an idea than an expression. But if there's expressive elements of the style that are included, then then that those aspects may be protectable. The next case is Doe versus GitHub. This is not an infringement case. This is a case that involving an AI code generator. And what that is, it's a, it's a tool that software developers use in their development environment, and it literally can help them auto-complete lines of code or create lines of code from scratch, uh, ideally. And that if a developer needs a particular function, for example, can say, give me uh, some code that does X, and the code generator will, will generate it. Um, it, it can also, they can also do other things. So these code generators are are trained on open source code primarily. Um, and because the open source code, they're covered by licenses that are very permissive in what you can do with the code. It's generally not an infringement, whether to train or, or otherwise. But what this case involves is in, instead of the infringement, it's a DMCA violation and open source code license violations. And so while the open source licenses are very permissive in what you can do, there's typically conditions or restrictions that go along with that, that broad use. And in some cases, in most cases, one of the uh, requirements is that you must maintain the copyright information that's associated with the open source code. Um, in this case, it's alleged that these copyright information is stripped out. And in, um, in other cases, uh, other open source licenses have other types of compliance obligations, like giving attribution to the, to the original developer, 
providing notification if you make modifications, other types of obligations like that. And the allegation is that the code that's that the open source that's being used to train, all that information is stripped away. And so that if any of the code makes it to the output, the copyright management information and the compliance obligations are not being met. In the next case, Prisma Labs, this involves uh, a violation of the uh, Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. And this case involves uh, a situation where Prisma uh, collected user images uh, to, to generate avatars. So you, you could upload your photos and Prisma would generate um, photorealistic avatars of you based on your images. Um, but it, and, and that was the stated reason and what the privacy policy covered for users to upload their their images. But the allegations are that Prisma went ahead and actually then used those images for other purposes, including to train AI models to develop uh, facial recognition technology. And because they, they use this protected information for a purpose for which they didn't have authorization, that the allegation is that it was an improper use. So th this is important. We'll come back to this. So even though they collected the information, I mean, if they only used it for purpose of generating avatars, that's what they told users they were doing. The information they got directly from the users, that part was probably okay. It's the fact that they took that content that they then had, they collected properly and used it for a different purpose that created the issue. And the last suit here, the Walters versus OpenAI, uh, highlights one of the things that uh, Jerry mentioned is that sometimes these these tools don't uh, output correct information. And this suit involves this guy, Walters, who I, I believe is a reporter. Um, <clears throat> and there was an, an output of uh, OpenAI that alleged that he had uh, embezzled funds and defrauded this uh, this foundation and that there was a lawsuit against him in, involving those activities. Uh, it turns out that uh, he sued because he uh, claims that there is no lawsuit against him regarding those issues, and he never was really involved with that foundation. And so this was something that was completely made up. And because it was published, it 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 uh, he uh, said it, it impacted his reputation, so he filed a defamation lawsuit. Um, beyond the district court cases, um, there's also regulatory actions. He won't go through all of them, but I'm going to focus a little bit on the FTC. Um, the FTC, one of one of the, I'd say, big investigations that are going on right now is uh, the investigation of FTC of, of open AI. And if you really want a checklist of kind of the types of issues that the FTC is thinking about in connection with AI, you should read this 20-page uh, civil investigative demand letter that the FTC sent to open AI. Um, it's it's a very broad, sweeping set of requests for information uh, and policies that OpenAI has with respect to their uh, their AI and some of the consumer harms that that the FTC is looking at. Without uh, going into all of the detail, just to give you a sense of some of the categories of information that the FTC is is looking at. Uh, in, in connection with this letter, the, the request that they made. Um, they they want to know how the tool is being marketed, the advertisements. One of the issues with the FTC is, are, are tools overstating what they can do? Are they clear about what the tools do? They also want to know how they've tested the products for accuracy. We talked about kind of the misinformation that can come out of them. Um, there's a lot of questions about how they collect information, um, how they use information, the data they use to train the models, how that that content is, the data is collected, whether they review the data. So some of the allegations, like in the in the Google case I mentioned earlier, is that these companies are just uh, sucking information off the web, not even reviewing it, and just using it to train their models. And that information could include information protect uh, covered by uh, child protection, by child privacy laws. Um, it could be other privacy-based information. It can be copyright information. It can be other information that they don't have a right to use. And so they're, they're trying to understand what's the process they use to vet the information they're training, or or do they even vet it? Um, 
And then there's various other categories of things, but one of the, the, the last kind of four you see on the bottom right there are uh, different types of policies that the FTC is asking about whether OpenAI has and, and kind of what their policies are. And this kind of ties into a big part of what we're going to talk about today. I mean, you need policies to help manage your legal risk, but if you're doing something and you end up with a regulatory investigation and you don't have policies that show you're taking reasonable steps, it's going to be a lot harder to uh, deal with those types of inquiries. And it's going to be kind of uncomfortable dealing with the uh, FTC or other organizations that that you may have to uh, encounter. So with that, we're going to kick it back to Jerry to talk about some other issues with training AI models. Thanks, Jim. So, you know, there there is quite a bit to go through. And I know Jim just went through some of the the lawsuits that are going on and some of the, the other things. But even in, as you think about your policy writing, as you think about what's going on there, you have to think about the way that these are trained. And Jim went through the manner in which they've input and taken in that information and created their, created their neural networks and the, and the models. But you know, and many of these companies, including OpenAI, as we just Jim just discussed, are dealing with the same issue right now. Do you have the right to use the data for which, on which you're training and for that purpose? So thinking about the case with the facial identification, if they didn't tell folks that they had the right, if they didn't tell users that they were going to use it for that purpose, you know, in many states, not just under the Illinois Act, but under other other acts, and especially outside of the U.S., you may not have the right to use it for that purpose. Now, we're still a little more wild westy here in the U.S. as far as this goes, but the other the other enforcement mechanism for a lot of folks, and go back to my comment about Sarah Silverman earlier, is the idea of using copyrighted content to train the AI models may constitute infringement. Now, of course, thinking about this, this is all very fact dependent. Were you using open access? Was the was it copyrighted? But the person's released the copyright in the public domain. You have a lot of those issues. And then, if it is an infringing issue, is fair use a defense? Because fair use has many, many. It, there are many, many ins and outs that apply in a fair use calculation. And is it one thing to teach a computer to? write in someone's style but not use their actual words versus you know quotation we have the same problem over and over with all new technology it's been an issue for libraries for years which is again how do libraries lend books are we looking at something like that the internet archive takes in and archives tons of copyrighted material but again we're not sure how to handle it entirely yet even though you know some the internet has been publicly available to most people since 1994 we're still fighting over the same a lot of the same issues they become more nuanced there's a lot to go go on so one thing i mentioned earlier was this idea of ai based code generators and a lot of the same same concepts apply in non code generating forms and jim please feel free to cut me off if i if i say something that you want to comment on. Uh, but there's there are, if you're thinking about these with code generators, you know, and we see it already, you know, companies like GitHub have GitHub Copilot. You've got you've got different tools that are helping generate code. Does that constitute infringement? Maybe. We don't know yet. We are probably going to find out relatively soon. Uh, and then if that use is licensed, are there light? Are, uh, is there? Do you have to do it in accordance with those, the restrictions or conditions of the OS license, the operating system license? Is the operating system released under the MIT license, as as many Linux distros are distributions are? And are there? Is it or is it? Are you using it with copyrighted code or something that's priv that's protected? like Apple's OS or Microsoft Windows? Does using the output subject the developer to infringement claims? You might have heard that Adobe and Microsoft are doing, are doing have agreed to cover the liabilities of folks that use their tools 
as long as they use them within their within their restrictions and requirements. So one way that Adobe is doing this, and again, we're talking generally, even though this is about code generators, Adobe is doing this by, they've effectively created their own private generative AI solution for, for creating images that they've populated where they know, where they've said, we have gone through and made sure that every single piece of data that we've used is public domain or usable. And therefore, if someone actually attacks you, if someone sues you for violating or infringing their rights, they may have a separate ability to protect you. And finally, there, there's a lot of questions here about licensing. Does AI, I mean, we're going further and further down a rabbit hole here, but if you use AI generated code to create a new software application, does it need to be licensed under, uh, for some reason I read operating systems, Jim, at any point you could have cut me off here and said you meant open source. It uh, is open I don't, source, I, yeah. don't yeah. I don't know why I said, I, I said OS is an operating system. I meant OS is an operating, uh, open source. Yeah. I am very sorry about that. Uh, so uh, when I said, so, copyrighted code or something released under a restrictive license or a pro prohibitive license like Microsoft Windows, if you're using that code, it's clearly infringement, or at least I think it would be clearly infringement. But if you're using open source code, do you now have a copyleft problem? If that an AI generated code is now considered copyleft, is will it infect the rest of your rest of the software you're developing, forcing you to release it under that code? again, under an open source license, a copyleft license, and we just don't know. Jim, is there anything you'd like to add there? I, I know yeah, I spoke I would a little say, bit. Yeah, no, so I would just say one or two things in addition to that. So one is the, the big problem. So most companies, most developers, over 98% of companies, I think is the last number I've seen, use open source if they're developing software, which is fine. Um, most companies at this point uh, have developed open source policies to manage the use of open source. And there's a, there's a number of things, but the, the two biggest things, one is there are certain open source licenses, as you mentioned, that if you if you use code covered under that license and you include that software in some other code, that other code has to be licensed under open source license. So the GPL license and various other ones have that um, that provision. And so you obviously want to avoid that, and most open source policies will will address that. And then the second is making sure that even if the use is not a harmful use, is it uh, you know do you have compliance obligations and making sure you meet those obligations? And so most companies have those policies; some still don't. And this is a really good reason why you should have it if you haven't developed yet. But the other thing that's that's important that in, in this context to understand is that. In most cases, when a developer uses open source, they know what open source they're using, right? They go to a repository, they download it, they select it, they can see what the license is. But one of the big problems with the with the AI-based code generators is you're just getting some code that comes out of the, the code generator. You don't, it, in and of itself, you don't necessarily know whether that code is a copy of an open source component or a copy of a portion of it, um, or if it's truly independently generated by the AI code generator. And so the the one of the challenges with using AI-based code generators, in addition to all the other open source challenges people have whenever they use open source, is to know when when is any of the code you're using uh, covered by an open source license. And so there's the, the next slide Jerry will talk about gets into some of the tools that these, these code generators have to help, help address this problem, although none of them are 100% effective. Right. I, I, I would add it's it's super important if you have a tremendous amount of developers, if you have one or two, it's easy to set rules. But remember, uh, most developers are not lawyers. They're not looking at, uh, you know, as much as we'd like to think that they're paying attention. And I love my development team. I love my R&D team. But I still get questions. Is am I allowed to use this? I saw it had it you've given us a policy on use of open source it's a, it's on the this code says it's on the license for this says it's on the yellow list as opposed to the green list or the red list and all my questions are always about what's on yellow it's never it's the green code they know they can use mit bsd all of that has no restrictions usually it's just say that you use attach the original license to it but you don't even have to do that 
red code is usually the infective. What I call red, I use a stoplight st style. What I call red is the stuff that really does open up a tremendous amount of risks if you modify or integrate it. It's the questions on these yellow code, and there are many tools out there. Again, we're focusing on code, but a lot of these same issues apply across the board. And what these tools do, you could first have filters to prevent the output of problematic code. You could tell some of these tools, do not use anything, and we'll get to this in a few, in I think on the next slide, that has not been rated at, oh, there we go. In fact, it is. Uh, that is not CC Creative Commons. There are, we say that on this slide, there are six. There is a few others, CC0, which is effectively a public domain license. Um, but effectively, you've got these Creative Commons licenses, you've got these open source licenses that tell you what doc, how something can be used. And when you're training these models, when you're thinking about them or you're using code or you're writing, you need to consider where these data sources have come from. So, you know, is it is it a web scraping? And OpenAI and a lot of these tools, Google, that's what they do. There's a case here, and Jim, if you want to talk a little bit about LinkedIn versus IQ, I, I'd be happy to have you do that. Yeah, and, I think it's too, I, I would I would probably just in the interest of time not really focus on it okay. too much. It, I mean, there's a whole body of law and web scraping. If you're doing that, there's a set of law that applies, whether you're doing it for AI purposes or not. And it's really just kind of, that's one of the re recent Supreme Court cases that addresses parts of it. So, but in all of these, one thing to look at is, is, is the, is what you're using these tools for? Is it, is there a way to filter something out? Can you find it? Is it under Creative Commons or some sort of other open source or semi-open source license? If the, and then even more important, if that information contains PII, can you use it? So one of the first tests I did was to ask back when ChatGPT first came out, was to ask about our chief operating officer just to see if it knew something. And it was actually, there was quite a bit of PII that had been pulled in from other sources. Now our COO had put that information on the internet. So yes, in some ways it was fair game, but you have to start considering what happens if a generative AI solution begins returning PII? Do you, who do you notify? What should be done? And thinking about the case earlier about defamation, that it could be closely linked because it is drawing conclusions with these. And no one, you know, with specific tools aimed at industries, whether it's aimed at lawyers, financial institutions, we're taking steps to restrict what those generative AI tools can do to put some guardrails around them. But other than the general trust and safety, if you go to ChatGPT and just ask generally, you don't have that restriction. Now, it will not produce some things because they put rules in for that, but it's also possible to get around those guide guide to get around those guardrails by asking a question a different way. So it's important to know that. And one more thing you see on the on the right side here with these six CC licenses, they basically go from attribution, which is James Gatto wrote this, to attribution, no commercial, non-commercial, no de derivatives, which means, yes, you still have to say James Gatto wrote this, but you can't use it for business purposes and you can't change it in any way. You'll see share alike. That means it just has to be released under the same same kind of license and people have to be able to do what you did with it. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, whoops. One thing to keep in mind, just because it is your data, it doesn't mean you have the right to use it. A lot of companies, especially uh, almost every company now has troves of user data collected under privacy policies and terms that didn't consider AI. I think we'll talk about it in a little bit, but you know, Zoom, even what we're on right now, stumbled a few weeks ago when they said that they were going to use voices and likenesses for training their AI. Uh, these companies that were realizing that the data can be quite valuable to train AI models. Uh, and to that end, you know, you can't exceed what you told the users they were going to use in the first place. Some of this is going to be a lot harder to do in Europe right now, or California, or Virginia, or Colorado, where they put in place new data privacy rules. But 
ultimately, you should be thinking as you're drafting your policies that you have to be clear to your teams, whether they're marketing, developers, or elsewhere, that just because something is your data doesn't mean you have the right to use it. As Jim mentioned earlier, Prisma Labs has tried, collected it for AI generation, but began to use it to train AI models. Ever Album is very similar. They're using the images to train facial recognition technology. And Jim, I think you're going to go into Ever Album in just a second. Yeah, um, in, indeed. So Ever Album is is the the facts are similar to what, what's in the pending Prisma case, but this is actually a matter that's been resolved. This was an FTC enforcement against Ever Album, um, and in, instead of being an avatar generator, Ever Album was an online photo storage and photo album generator. Um, again, people uploaded their images voluntarily uh, for purposes of photo storage and, and albums. Um, and that was the reason it was originally collected. Uh, Ever Album ultimately decided they wanted to build a facial recognition app. And they, they did using those photos plus other photos that they, they obtained from, from publicly available sources. So they had kind of a combined set of, of images they were using to train the models. Um, and they were doing some other stuff like not deleting photos when users deleted their accounts and some other stuff. And so for various reasons, the FTC took action against them. Um, long and short of it was they really didn't have much of a defense. They ended up settling. And the remedy was what's referred to as algorithmic disgorgement. And what that means is that because Ever Album was unable to sort out like what images they got that were publicly available and what were images that they improperly used, the FTC said you have to delete all of your album, your algorithms, and all of your your models, uh, anything that was tainted with the improperly used photos, and so they had to basically stop using that data. They had to, you know, they could have retrained, go back to ground zero and retrain. Um, the reason that this is really important is that for companies that are training. The, the cost of training these models is not cheap. Um, companies are spending tens and, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars to train these models. If you're subject to algorithmic disgorgement, you basically lose that entire investment. So you, you want to make sure this is just a really, really key reason why you want to make sure that if you get into training your own models, that you vet the data before you do the training, because if not, you you may be subject to algorithmic disgorgement as well. One of the things you can also do, it, it, you know, to to mitigate some of these issues, is that you can, if you do batch training, so you you train on different batches of data. If you can identify what's you know kind of in each batch and store a version of your models um, at at each way, each step along the way, if it turns out that like a, a recent version includes some data that you shouldn't have been using you can sometimes roll it back to a prior version that you know was clean and free of that data. And so that versioning can help minimize the issues. But if you if you're if you bet the data, you should avoid those issues in the first place. One of the other things to think about, so we talked a lot about the training side of, of, of AI. There's, you know, kind of the other sets of issues deal with the inputs. So when, once the models are trained and deployed, users uh, you know, use the tools. And, and so users provide inputs and they get outputs. So we're going to talk about some of the issues with the inputs and outputs now. Um, one of the main things from a company perspective that you need to make sure you understand is that uh, some of these tools, the inputs aren't confidential. So if your employee puts in information that uh, is is part of a business plan saying, hey, he, we had these new ideas, write a business plan for me. If that, And people have done that with these AI generators. Uh, you're putting your confidential plans in there. And some of these tools, as I, as I mentioned, um, don't protect that information and, and they use it to retrain their models. And if someone says, hey, give me a new idea to modify my business in this industry, they may output what your your user put in. So that's that's part of how it, it can you can lose the confidentiality. So what's really important to understand is that each of these tools operate differently, even within the same tool, you may have different methods of operation. So th this example here is with ChatGPT, there's both an enterprise version and an individual version. With the enterprise version, you access it via an API. And with the individual version, you access it via web or mobile app directly, not, not through an API. And the reason that's important to understand is that this little snippet of the terms of use from ChatGPT 
distinguishes on how they, they use your content, depending on how you access the system. So the, the first part says that they, they will not use your content if it's uh, received from an API, where they will use it if it's non-API, so web, web direct or, or mobile. So just understanding this right here, right? If you're concerned about the confidentiality of your what user, your employees put in, knowing which tools and which versions or, or which implementations uh, or options under a particular tool provide protections and which don't is an important part of a, of a policy in deciding which tools to approve and which ones not to approve. So some, some of the, the tools, they will say, we will use your input to, to further train. They don't protect the confidentiality. And, and many companies will, will not approve those tools for employee use for that reason. Um, on the output side, there's, um, you know, one of the big issues is, you know, is because these are generators of, of expressive content, is, is the output infringing? And if it does infringe, the question is who's liable? Is it the tool provider who's creating that image for you or, or whatever the content is? Or is it you as a user, which may take that image and publish it or make further copies or, or do other things that would constitute copyright infringement? And the short answer is, under under infringement law, it can be either, depending on the facts, um, and it may be both in, in, in some cases. Um, so the, as between the copyright owner, who, whoever owns the copyright and the material that, that's infringing, they could probably sue either the tool provider or the user. Most of the lawsuits to date have been, to date have been against the tool providers, but I guarantee if history is, is a, a, you know, kind of a guidepost, once there's a finding of infringement against uh, some of the tools, plaintiff's lawyers will start suing users for 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 using infringing content. We'll we'll definitely see that. But one of the other things, so, so people worry about, you know, if I if I let my employees use these tools, am I liable for infringement? The answer is you may be. But again, as part of the policy, and Jerry alluded to this earlier, some of the tools are now providing indemnities to users, saying if you use our tool, and there may be certain conditions or restrictions on how you use it. Um, will indemnify you if there's infringement. And so th that's, again, as far as selecting tools, if you know who's providing an indemnity that's meaningful and who's not, um, that's one way to help mitigate the, the infringement side. What some people don't realize is some of these tools, in terms of service, state that you as a user indemnify the tool provider if, there, if you use uh, output that infringes. And so, again, that's an example of a tool that we wouldn't recommend most companies use. You're not only taking on liability for potential infringement, but you're, you're also indemnifying the tool provider, which, um, you know, doesn't doesn't make sense in, in a lot of cases. Um, th there can be other types of issues with the output of if it was subject to a license and there's compliance obligations and and you don't do it, you can have breach of contract. Um, you know, you, you should instruct your users to look at the output, not only for accuracy, as, as Jerry mentioned earlier, um, but also common sense, right? If you see trademark, a trademark or a logo in there, um, or if you see name, image, and likeness of a celebrity, or if you see something that looks like personally identifiable information, that's all stuff you should probably be careful about using or not use because it, it could create liability. Um, that's not an exclusive list, but that's that's some of the key issues. One of the other key issues is, is the ownership and the protectability of the output of generative AI. So again, the terms of use for these different tools treat ownership differently. Some don't address it. Some say you own the output. Some say don't say you own it, but they say that they don't claim ownership. So it's kind of a confusing morass under some of these tools as to what you own. But what's also interesting is that some of these say that you own the output, like OpenAI, for example, it says you own the output. Um, but they recognize that another user may generate the same output as well and that you don't own their output. So what does that mean to own something if someone else can own the same exact thing, right? It's not exclusive ownership for sure. And it's compounded by the fact that the output of generative AI is typically not copyright protectable, according to the Copyright Office, at least in the, in the U.S. And the reason is, is that there's no human authorship. And the Copyright Office has issued guidance on this um, in, in March. And basically it says that only you can only get copyright protection for, for things where the creative work is uh, under control of a, of a human. And providing inputs or prompts to generative AI is, is not sufficient. They, they, they've, they've said that. 
Additionally, it's it's important to understand that this guidance from the Copyright Office now, if you rely on copyright registrations, if you're using generative AI as part of your development process um, and you file copyrights, you have to disclose if any of the material you include in your copyright was generated with, with AI mm -hmm. and you have to disclaim coverage for that. And this applies not just to new applications you file, but if you have applications pending already or even issued registrations where there was generative AI uh, used and you didn't disclose it, you have to go back and disclose it to the trademark or the copyright office. Otherwise, your registration may be invalid. Um, <clears throat> and then last, on patents, uh, kind of a similar thing, right? So I'm not going to go into some great detail, but there's a lot of technology being developed in the AI space. And you can, you can patent AI technology <clears throat> just like any other uh, technology if, if it meets the requirements. 18% um, of all patent applications filed this year, according to the patent office, um, are AI related. That, that's a pretty, pretty big number across all technologies. 18% are AI. That's on the technology. There's a there's one guy, Stephen Thaler, who developed a machine that he alleged invented something that the, the AI machine itself invented. He filed a patent application, listed the machine as the inventor, and the patent office rejected it, saying it has to be a human author. So analogous to the copyright side, you can't have machines inventing and getting patents uh, for that. So that that's and that was uh, upheld um in district court, the federal circuit, and the Supreme Court denied cert. So I think it's pretty clear that AI itself cannot be an inventor. Um, the, the Copyright Office and the Patent Office are holding hearings and, and getting input from industry right now. They're struggling with, so how much can someone use it if there's like co-development or co-authorship? Or what, what, are, what are the parameters that would enable people to use generative AI and still get IP protection? And that's something that's uh, evolving. Um, on the FTC side, um, there are uh, a number of things the FTC has been doing for a number of years, and 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 uh, on on AI, not just generative AI, but uh, certainly their um, enforcement is is and their their attention has been increasing. Um, but but they focus on you, you know under the uh, FTC Act Section Five and also the Fair Credit Reporting Act and Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Um, they're focused on unfair and deceptive trade practices, anything that's a consumer harm, um, deceptive for, for, you know, kind of uh, consumer activities. Um, and that they include within that, um, if you falsely advertise what your AI can do, anything where there's uh, bias or discrimination in the output, they consider that to be uh, unfair or deceptive. Um, if you're using AI in, in connection with any kind of credit there's uh, not only the FTC, but the, um, the CFPB, Consumer, Consumer Perfected Financial Board, um, and, and other uh, regulations that may apply and limit what you can do. And you really have to ensure that there's no, there's no bias involved in, in your algorithms or the data that's being used uh, to train them. Um, the other issue on um, the big issue with the FTC is privacy. We've talked about that already. So I'll just kind of touch on this briefly. Um, you, you need to be aware of, uh, you know, the use of privacy, either in training your data or if any of it happens and if any of the output that you get of a third party tool includes uh, privacy protected and, you know, what looks like personally identifiable information, you want to be careful about that. Um, you need to make sure you have the right to use data if you are training. Uh, Jerry mentioned the Zoom situation. I mean, some people are just changing their terms of service, say, hey, we can use your, your content for, you know, to train our models. Uh, it, it seems like it wasn't very well thought through. They, they were going to create, uh, use training of any of the videos that people use. So if you're an, an attorney and you're talking to a client on Zoom thinking it's a private conversation, they were going to use that information to train. Uh, certainly, it caused a big uproar among attorneys, but also many others who rely on the confidentiality of those tools. Um, and then one other thing that's uh, kind of interesting to note is that there's a you know one of the things with uh, with AI is if it gets a voice print, one of your voice prints, it can use that to generate any statement by you, and it'll sound just like you. And there's there's a number of ways that's been used by people for bad purposes. Uh, but but the FTC considers that a form of, of biometric privacy. And so 
if you're voice printing, people are storing voice prints, whether it's for recognizing a customer when they come back to your site or, or other purposes, even if it's a legitimate purpose, you, you, it, is, it is biometric privacy information and it needs to meet, you, you use it in a way that complies with other privacy laws. Um, and then just on on this uh, this last slide here, just at a high level, again, it's not just the FTC. Various agencies have you know, kind of banded together to focus on making sure there's no discrimination and bias in the use of AI. If, if you haven't watched it, I strongly encourage you to watch a, a PBS documentary called Coded Bias. Um, and it really highlights how AI, the, the tools itself, the, the data can include biased information and lead to biased results. But there's also ways in which tools, even if they're not biased, are being used in a way that are that are allegedly discriminatory. So, uh, you know, I think that those are uh, that's a really good um, documentary to watch if you want to learn more about that. Um, Jim, and... did, your screen, did your screen freeze? Because uh, there we are. OK, sorry. Um, yeah. And so that's it. So I'm going to kick it back to Jerry and talk about a couple on terms of service. But one thing real quick, there's a question on why um, it's not considered uh, invention or copyrighted. Um, and the 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 answer is that the, the um, uh, copyright offices basically said based on years of cases that, that it only protects human authorship. And, and again, the the input is even though a, hu a human prompts the AI to generate whatever the expressive content is, the uh, the copyright office said that if the if what if what the expressive content that's created is from the AI tool itself, then that's not human authored, right? Because the input is just an idea in most cases. So um, that that's kind of the reason to for, for the purpose of the question yeah. and the uh, Q and A. I, I suppose if you wrote a a long enough input that it was not just a concept or an idea, but was rather, you could probably protect your input. You, I'm sure that, and I, I know for a fact that a lot of companies, especially that are developing these solutions, are considering the input to be protected or private, trade secret, however you want to put it. But that's the prompt, the way you're drafting that. Um, right. Right. Yeah, so, but but if the output is the right, it, well, the, even that like there, there's there's one case. I mean, just in the interest of time, won't go into de too great a detail. But there's a uh, Christina Castanova wrote filed a uh, copyright registration, um, and she uh, for a comic book, and she she got the registration. Apparently, the copyright office didn't understand that that she used AI. She she kind of published the fact that she got a a, a copyright on an AI generated work. Copyright office said we did what? They went back and they reexamined it. They asked her for additional information, and despite her providing uh, a response that she spent over a hundred hours iterating with these images, they didn't give her protection for the images. They they let her get protection for the text which she drafted and the layout, but they said even though there was significant human input uh, input, in their view there wasn't sufficient. Despite the hundred hours or more of inputs, it wasn't enough because it was still all just ideas. So it's not a question of volume; it's a question of you look at the expressive content and was it was that generated so if you put input an image and said change this right like you know that that might be different than if you just say hey create an image that does x y and z or make this bigger or change this like those are all ideas the expression if it comes from the machines it's probably not going to be protectable according to the copyright office right and i think that for those of you who we're going to get in the policy go deeper into a little bit of policy in just a moment uh, we can actually skip this slide. I realized that it, I duplicated a slide and then copied it. So, uh, uh, but with some of the new stuff, those of you who have employees using Adobe tools or, or otherwise, uh, it's going to be an open question on what's protectable because yes, it's human. Human may cut out a face, but the AI may be generating new faces. Uh, you may make changes. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of time before we really know what it is. Uh, Going quickly through policy, you must you must consider the specific versions of tools. As we mentioned earlier, there is the issue of are you using a paid for tool, browser based versus API, paid versus free, and you in drafting your policies and determining what to approve, you have to make the decision for your organization about which options are acceptable. If you're only going to tell people they can use private controlled enterprise level solutions, 
then you've got to say you can't use your own chat GPT account. You can't use your own mid journey account. And, you know, also, but also you could consider, is it going to be an external or internal? If I generate an image internally, and that's not to be seen anywhere else, but it's being used internally, I might say, generate me an image of a puppy or generate a short description of, of a tool, and I'm only going to use that internally. Maybe there's a different rule. Maybe it works a lot like open source does open in, at the end, where there's different rules. If you're using something only internally versus externally, you might choose to have different policies in place, but you want to be clear on this. Uh, as Jim was mentioning, you want to be able to distinguish between the use of the content as an asset versus inspiration. If I say I need inspiration, again, we'll use a puppy of a black and white puppy, uh, you know, or inspiration for a story about, uh, about skyscrapers, maybe I say inspire me with one paragraph about a skyscraper and I write my own, but using it to actually generate the material has to be considered in different ways. Uh, you want to make sure that your AI platform, and we'll talk about this a little more in two weeks when we talk about vendor contracts and negotiating AI gener contracts with generative AI providers, who gets to use the inputs? Who, who owns the output and the, who owns the input? Who owns the output? And how is that being structured? Uh, keeping on, you should make sure that the policy, uh, next slide, I'm sorry, there we go. Uh, so make, uh, I think, did I miss something? There we go. You should try to get that enterprise version where it's available. You should make sure that they give you administrative controls that you can say who can use what, what legal issues are you trying to avoid? Can, will you will someone be able to use these tools to create copyrighted content or replicate copyrighted content or not? You want to make sure that you your policies require compliance with FTC guidance and of course with EEOC and of and and other groups that monitor workplace enforcement. You want to make sure that they comply with all the federal rules and other rules that may govern where you're working. Uh, additionally, especially if you're dealing with HR issues, pay attention to state law. California, New York, they all have laws about the use of AI in employment decisions, not just on the creative side, not just on the code generation side, but on who can actually use it. How can you take this into account? And if you, you know, you can't use AI to make certain decisions, you have to justify it. You have to explain why a decision was made. Think of it a lot like when you're going right now to ask questions about, uh, situations, credit reports, anything that's there, make sure you're looking at the state laws for those for those areas. As you're drafting or reviewing these policies, we'll go on. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Make sure you're, as you're drafting, what other policies do you have about workplace conduct? If you have a no harassment policy, if you have an anti-harassment policy, if you have a bias anti-bias policy, you want to make sure to reference those, but you also want to make sure to reference your use of workplace resources policy. You want to be able to look at these. And I know I keep saying you want, because I'm stressing how important this is as you're drafting them, to know what, how they interact with other policies. Because if you have some, if you have policies that conflict and something goes wrong, and later on those get introduced into evidence, you're going to have to explain why one policy conflicts. You're going to be having to explain why something applies or doesn't apply and how come you made that decision. Uh, you also want to think, you also want to think about the restrictions that may be necessary on authorized purposes. For example, again, we have a product here at Contract Cut AI called Leah Copilot. We have done a ton to make sure it's applicable for legal usage. But perhaps if someone tried to use it for a different purpose, I would make sure my policy says, this could be used only by a supervise a lawyer super with a lawyer supervision. Uh, you have to consider that certain purposes may be okay. Other purposes, you might say, you cannot use it for these purposes, whether it's HR, whether it's legal, whether it's finance, and so on. You also, again, going back to this confidentiality issue with these policies, what kind of tool, what kind of tools are you using? Are you using the public? publicly available models? Are you using APIs? Are you using private models? Are you using, 
are you using enterprise models? Because they're going to have different rules on what can happen. Um, and finally, one last set of thoughts. And I, I really do mean, these were thoughts. I was writing this and I'm like, oh, this is good. This is good. We should keep adding more thoughts. So, you know, as you're thinking about these, think about what has to go in there, aligning with your other policies uh, and going forward. Is, does, is it going to contain offensive, discriminatory, discriminatory or inappropriate content? Will there be a requirement that it has to be reviewed by a human legal financial health care where we're requiring human review? You have to make sure you review all the output currently for accuracy, disclosure, and bias. Those of you who saw last week's presentation, we had a whole discussion about how mid-journey would generate extremely biased images when you requested something. And finally, you know, make sure you prohibit legal infringing or other or other use cases. Uh, I know we're running out, we've actually run over. So if you are planning to leave, you can go ahead. You've been here for the full hour, but I will cover the last few things and answer any questions. Uh, third party contractors, ensure that they're using it within your policies. You want to make sure that they're not using third party materials, loading them into the generative AI solutions you select. And, but we recommend calling this out specifically. Uh, you may have to restrict what your creative contractors use generative AI for, or you might have to say you can use certain tools, but not other tools. And also, some policies, some requirements now require them to disclose if those content, if they've used generative AI in the past. This is going to be a lot like, again, the courts that are now requiring generative AI disclosures before filing. For those of you who have who are litigators, you've probably heard about these. We talked about them a little bit in the last session. And document the use. Uh, another, another thing to keep in mind, you for training AI, if you are training AIs internally, oh, sorry, Jim, this is yours, but I can keep going. Oh, yeah, just real quick. So it, 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 kind of the parallel here is like, so the, the, the last kind of set of slides is it's pretty much if you're developing policies for your employee use of AI, um, if you're training AI, there's just a whole nother set of issues that we talked about. You need to think about, I mean, a big part of it is ensuring you have the data, doing a data mapping, make sure that you have the right to use it, uh, to train, um, oops, um, and, uh, deal with any other compliance obligations. So depending on if it's licensed data, making sure you comply with any obligations, um, and there, there can be many other aspects of the policy if you're training on AI. Again, I would go back and look at the open AI civil investigative demand letter um, to get a sense of some of the other areas you want to think about as far as a checklist. And just one, one last thought for me before Jerry will Jer Jer cover the last slide. So really to kind of put all this together, um, one of the things I'm doing a lot of work with companies on right now is First, training the companies on these issues and more, depending on the nature of the company, their industry, their intended uses of AI, to help uh, anywhere from board of directors, C the C-suite, uh, legal departments, to understand the legal issues. And once they understand the legal issues and understand how their company wants to use the AI, then they can develop a custom policy that works for that company based on this. And so for you know a lot of companies that really, you know, we talk about how do we start get started building a policy. The first part is the education and gathering the set of use cases from the different constituents within the company, and then working with kind of knowledgeable attorneys to kind of put together a, a policy that works for you. And a part of my job as chief evangelist is also thinking about the future, what can happen in the future, some of these questions that are coming up. Uh, and, you know, professors, governments are discussing how do we deal with AI in the future? You know, will a robot, will an AI count as a worker? If you, FMLA leave requires a certain number of work, certain number of employees across borders, will an AI that's performing the tasks of uh, performing some paralegal tasks, will they count as a lawyer? Will, will how will this apply? Will you be re responsible for algorithmic discrimination? And there's going to be a question about whether it's intentional or unintentionally discriminatory. Uh, you know, did did the builders of that algorithm 
think, say, I'm going to intentionally make sure that this discriminates against black people, Muslims, or whatever, or did they simply feed it with various information that seemed to have a, a bias, an inherent bias that no one knew about? Uh, one question someone raised in a, in a pallet of, panel I've done recently is, if I'm overseeing robots, am I a manager? Do I qualify for work and hour wage and hour purposes, or am I an employee who's on an hourly basis? Can an AI be, and again, the, some of these questions seem silly, but they're actually being thought of. Can an AI be responsible for harassment? If an AI is taught, you know, Jim just mentioned these, how to train AI, even thinking about the very beginning, should an employer be liable for a harassing AI or a discriminatory AI, not just on algorithmic discrimination, but if the AI internally does something harassing to an employee? Does AI count as a bargaining unit? This, this has come up with all the strike and labor actions recently. Will an AI be counted? Does it Because an AI, right now, we're not paying a computer. We're paying a vendor. We're paying for these solutions. Uh, these might seem futuristic. Like I said, people are talking about them. They're coming up in in these in conferences. They're coming up among folks who think who are thinking about what might be next. And while they may seem futuristic and silly today, they're actually being argued over. And how and they're going to have to be something that we'll have to think about. Maybe not this year. Maybe not in five years. But 10, 15 years from now, uh, you know, these may actually be issues we're really dealing with on a daily basis. So. With that, uh, Jim, anything else you'd like to add? No, uh, I think this is a wrap. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for tuning in. And we look forward to having you join us for the third leg of this three-part uh, webinar series that will be coming up soon. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful afternoon.